before the initiation begins. The subjects are studied. Even their dreams are recorded. Before the initiation begins, the testing areas are selected. The sorority house, the sanitarium, the empty shopping mall. And just before the initiation begins, a toast is required. Being young, staying young, and dying young. A fraternal tradition for over 100 years, created for only one purpose. Pleasant dreams. The initiation, the ceremony that will never die, as long as new blood is pledged. Hey, y'all, and welcome back to another episode of the Cult Cinema Circle podcast. My name is Jesse, and I'll be your host now on today's episode. We are going to be covering and talking about a little film from 1984. It's uh, in the horror genre, and I think it's a little bit underrated and underseen, so that's why I want to talk about it today. We're talking 1984's The Initiation. Now, you may have heard of this movie back if you listened to the sorority horror episode I did back in January, and I talked about how I liked this movie and how I would do a single episode on it, but oh, don't worry, I'm not doing this alone today. I'm doing this with the same person who I uh, did that sorority horror episode with and a multitude of other episodes on my podcast because he's just a fun guy to talk to. Uh, But please welcome back to the show, Pickens Berenger. Hey, Pickens, how are you? Hello, Jesse. I am wonderful. I'm hungover and I am happy to be here. I love that. Did you at least like enjoy your night after that? I guess I did hook up with a bartender. So yeah, I would say, you know, on the scale of nights, it was a, it was about a solid nine out of 10. And I like that for you. Oh, oh, oh. you know, you keep me young Pickens. I just like that you're a slut and it's fun. Uh, I mean that in the best way possible, really. Oh no. No judgment. Slut is the ultimate phrase of expression of great, but you know what I'm trying to say? Yes. Sure. Yes. yes. Let's go with that. (laughs) Also the gays, you know, plus you and your boyfriend are like super cute. So I mean, shit, if it works for you, whatever it's all good here today though uh, we're talking about the initiation now me my history with this movie is pretty straight standard because it literally came from doing the show with you because you literally when you came on for sorority babes in the slime ball bolorama you didn't really care for that movie and i really didn't care for it either but you said well you know if you want a movie that's actually kind of good go watch the initiation instead and i was like okay well let me check this out and then i checked it out and i really liked it so i guess for me at least and that's literally my history with it let me know a little bit uh from you though pickens like when did you first like find this movie and i think i also want to know like what kind of draws you to it and makes you interested in it where you know you'd want to come on and talk about it yeah so i i stumbled upon it like kind of randomly actually it was during that golden age of youtube like right before google like acquired it, right before google acquired it where you could actually watch like pirated movies like you know you would have to watch it like in 10 minute segments and i know that there was like this channel that like had uploaded like a whole bunch of slasher movies because i was like super into them and I know, like, I watched, that's how I watched Slumber Party Massacre for the first time and the God and the Prowler. And then so the initiation was on there and I was like, oh, I'll watch it. And I just really dug it. I thought it was super cool. I really liked the cinematography. And I'm a little bit, I like, I like movies that take places in malls. Like, that's really fun to me. Like Dawn of the Dead and, um, this one and Chopping Mall, obviously the best. So I just, I don't know. I just, 
saw it randomly and it just became like one of those hidden gems for me yeah i mean that's totally fair uh along with mall horror have you watched the uh movie what is it phantom of the mall eric's revenge have you seen that movie before i actually have not but it's 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 on my never-ending list you know i'm always yeah. like i'm gonna watch it but yeah i've been really wanting to see it it looks cool yeah it is kind of fun so it's funny because it sounds like it's a sequel it's not um and it has um oh god it has morgan Fairchild's in it and also Polly Shore in one of his first roles as well he's also in there um, I forget who the main guy is oh he was in that movie Popcorn uh, you remember Popcorn from the 90s oh, yes 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 he's um, in I that movie someone too someone who loved that movie so much and I also love actually that movie. <laughs> a few years ago Carolina Theater I'm plugging that if you're ever in North Carolina come to the Carolina Theater they did a screening of it and the lead actress came and did like a Q&A after and it was really awesome Oh, Jill Shonlin, I love that. Oh my god. I mean, but that's my history with it. I love that's your history with it. It's super fun. Yeah, I do love Chopping Mall as well. I think it's a great little film. Um, but yeah, this is like an interesting one. And I mean, really, like, I think what I like about it too is just like, I like that it gets in and out too. It's like 90 minutes. Generally, it's good. But also like, I don't know. It's It's a <laughs> well, we'll talk about what we think maybe doesn't work, maybe, because there's some little things here and there. But like overall, I still think it's a fun time and, and I'm glad to talk about it. And again, like I said in my my intro, you know, I I think it's underseen. I don't think a bunch of people know about it. So I want more people to see it. And again, we'll kind of talk all about that. But as we normally do on this show, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, production, figures, all that fun stuff we can kind of talk about. But this movie is actually celebrating 40 years uh, this uh, month. As you're hearing this, it'll be in April. So it came out April 6th of 1984. Uh, it's about 97 minutes and it was distributed by New World Pictures. Our buddies over there at New World Pictures will probably end up talking about a little bit like we have before. I could not find any budget information on this movie. I mean, I would say the budget probably wasn't really hell that high to be honest but oh, no it's probably definitely on the lower end for sure right. but it, they, they, they do they do a good job making it look expensive though i will say that i think so too absolutely and also i could find no real box office information of this most likely because it never came out in theaters probably i don't even know like Maybe it was just a home video release because we did talk about that before that. And again, if it did ever have a theatrical release, I don't know nothing about it in terms of numbers. So there you go. I will say, though, that this movie has zero on Rotten Tomatoes from critics, which again tells me that what? nobody has covered it. Mm. Nobody's reviewed it. And also, like, I don't I, it's not necessarily the movie's fault. It's it was it was like 1984 when it came out. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely like the, I'm sure the critics at the time were definitely over the slasher movie. I'm sure yeah. they were, it, it could have been like the greatest movie of all time. And they still, yeah. if it was a slasher movie, they were going to give it zero stars. Yeah, it's that. And also, I think there's only like three reviews on there. And I don't think that's enough to even get a rating on Rotten Tomatoes. This is an aggregate. So like, yeah, that's why it is. And rudely enough, the audience scores a 33%. These people don't have taste. Zero. I'm just Zero taste. God. <laughs> Zero people. taste. God. You're saying the obscure slasher movie about sorority girls breaking into a mall. You guys don't like that? God, get, get your shit together, Carol. Get your shit together. Oh, my God, Linda. Anyway, I have an Aunt Linda. She's awesome. But, like, you know, whatever. And then a 2.9 out of 5 on Letterboxd. Again... Uh, but I do think there are people who do like this movie and like you and me and other people as well that aren't you and me. So it it's all good. And you know what? You're listening to this episode for that very reason. So there's a bit of an interesting kind of thing going on with this movie because this was actually a, uh, a dual directing thing. Uh, so this was credited directed by larry stewart who's really only known for this movie but it was also partly directed by peter crane as well now you can sort of tell that though because peter crane the way he directed i think was a little bit more 
like cinematic and you know he kind of came from you know doing films more so whereas larry stewart did a lot more um, television so that's why this movie feels sort of like this 80s tv movie at times um it really so, yeah. it really does especially like it, it definitely has like an a plot b plot there's it is very te- it is, does feel like a more like a television movie kind of thing with like gore and nudity in it essentially yeah exactly so and i really don't know much about uh mr peter crane but but I didn't really find much about him. But yeah, so, but it was credited to Larry Stewart, which really he's the only, this is the only movie he ever even directed. Uh, apparently he was maybe in a few movies back in the day. Uh, but again, I think he was more of a television director, it seems like. Um, and then the writer of this movie is uh, Charles Pratt Jr. Um, the only thing I know about him is apparently he executive produced Cruel Intentions 2. Uh, the one that With does Amy not have Adams? any. Adams? Yes. Oh, my God. Is it Jonathan O'Keefe in it, too? I think so. It's been it's been so long. I remember, like, I bought, like, uh, the all of them. Like, Cruel Intentions 1, 2. And I, isn't there a third one, I think? There probably yeah. is. Yeah, I binge watched all of them and then I binge watched all of Wild Things like in this weekend. And it was like oh. a lot, a lot. It was a lot. That sounds really fun, actually, kind of sort of not because of the Cruel Intention sequels, but mostly because of Wild Things, honestly. I love Wild Things. It just oh, I just love so it so good. much. It's it's so good. Oh, my God. I need to get that on Blu-ray. It'll it'll happen. Don't worry. It'll you be, can, you, you need to see Kevin Bacon's bacon in HD. It's just it's it's beautiful. Mwah. Oh, hell yeah. Oh, hell yeah. So excited. But yeah, so that was him who did that. Also, a fun, a fun little thing. I know you must like Cruel Intentions. Have you seen like Dangerous Liaisons with like oh my Uma God, Thurman yes. and all them? When I found out that Cruel Intentions was essentially like a remake or like a reimagining adaptation of it. yeah yeah i was like oh i want to watch this and glenn close is just mm-hmm. how, okay at the academy because the oscars are i guess at this point have already happened at but they're the academy, tomorrow and when we're recording they're tomorrow yes they are tomorrow why has glenn close not gotten an oscar same with tony collette i don't understand that because literally fucking okay have you seen the movie in and out with um kevin klein in it oh my god like uh, it's been years but yeah but she's in it. She's like presenting an award. How has she not won one before? This is bullshit. It is complete and utter bullshit. Like it, it, even if it's like an honorary award, just give her something. God almighty. No. I know she was just so good. Oh my gosh. She is so good in that movie too. Uh, uh, side note. Cause this is what we do on our show sometimes. So, okay. Who do you think for tomorrow? Cause I have not watched all the Oscar movies. Who do you think is going to win? I want to know some maybe your predictions if you have. Ugh, I'm feeling like okay, so my dream of dreams if Barbie just sweeps everything and wins everything, okay. but it's not realistic. It's not going to happen. I'm honestly I'm leaning towards Oppenheimer. I think that's going to win. It, was it a good movie? Yeah, but uh, I don't know. I I have a feeling they're just going to throw it all to Christopher Nolan. He's going to win, and I don't know. That's I don't know why I'm feeling that way, but yeah, that's fair. I do think I do believe that um, Oppenheimer will probably win. Honestly, I kind of want Divine Joy Randolph to win. Like, I kind of want her for the holdovers. I do want to watch the holdovers as well. Oh, I want to see it, too. I've heard uh, that's the one movie I've heard nothing but good things about. Like every single person that's seen it says this is like super good. Actually, Mm, I yeah I, either Paul Giamatti is definitely going to win best act he might be I, it's either between him and uh Killian Murphy I think but uh. yes Paul Giamatti I do think will probably win which I'm totally fine with I'm very happy with that and yeah I don't know I will have to see yeah I don't know be on the lookout for a uh, an Alexander Payne movie coming on the podcast soon because it's celebrating 25 years and it's gonna be a fun conversation but yeah so anyway we'll see how the oscars go tomorrow and then in the future we'll see how you know maybe we predicted the future who knows back to our movie we have two composers in this movie we have gabriel black and also lance ong they're really only known for this movie um i don't think the it the took score... two people to write the music in this movie oh my god <laughs> like that's so amazing although i will say i do think that the score of this movie or like the music of the movie obviously um you know, it, it it's 
it's this it's cheesy no house 80s on movie. sorority row but it's 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 fine yeah no it's and that's what kind of makes me like interested in it to be perfectly honest but you know that's just me um and then also our cinematographer is george turrell the only thing i know he did um is a movie called steel dawn and then also a movie called left behind the movie and left behind the movie oh. is a kirk cameron movie oh honey that was growing up evangelical christian uh yes i am very familiar with the left behind series mm-hmm. oh no oh no <laughs> Oh God! I'm glad you glad you got out of that. Uh, truly unscathed. Oh, hopefully a little unscathed. You might be a little uh, scathed. I, you know what? Compared to most, pretty unscathed actually. Like I was just kind of like I got to a point. I was just like, good for you, not for me. I'm gonna go suck dicks. Exactly. There you go. Love that. But you know who probably also maybe sucks dicks, but we're okay with that. Is our girl called Daphne Zuniga in this movie? Uh, <laughs> um. I mean, listen. Oh, oh gosh, I love her. She's just <laughs> she is. Why do Miss I Melrose Place? Yes, mm-hmm. she was on Melrose Place. She was also in Spaceballs. For those who like that movie, why do I feel like Daphne Zuniga would also fit being on The Housewives? I just feel like oh, she. You know why? Because she kind of looks like Lisa Vanderpump a little bit. Like a little bit, just a little bit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Her IMDb picture, if you look at her IMDb picture from like afar, she does kind of give some Lisa Vanderpumpness. Uh huh. Yeah. So maybe that's why it is. But maybe she's just like doesn't want to be in that. And I totally understand it. I don't even know if she's married or not. She probably is. But I mean, you don't need, you don't necessarily need to be married to be a housewife. You know? uh, yeah. <laughs> Which I just think is so funny. But. <laughs> You know, okay, fine. But we also we already have Kyle Richards. We already have the horror icon, you know, in the Housewives. We don't need to. That's very true. And it also, like, this movie does feel like a weird soap opera. So it kind of makes sense that she would then go on to be in a weird soap opera in the 90s. I appreciate that. That's what we that call poetic so- justice. It, it, it is very soap opera-y. Especially, yeah. oh, yeah, it is very soap opera-y. You're right. Oh, my God. I never thought of that. It, it like a little bit is just a tiny bit but you know it's fine then we got to talk about a little bit about uh the mother of this movie um who came from another movie about mothers psycho one and psycho two miss vera miles we got to talk a little bit about her you know i mean i like really enjoy psycho and psycho two as well um and i think she does a pretty good job did she do anything else like in the horror sphere uh, other we could also talk a little bit about um, her being in this movie because uh, that was the whole thing. But uh, yeah, what did you think of her? I really like her. Like, yeah, you know, like Psycho is in my top three Hitchcocks for sure. To my knowledge, I mean, I don't really, I don't think she really. I mean, she probably, I think she did some thrillers to my knowledge, but like mm-hmm. kind of like that. But I thought she, you know, like in Psycho Two, actually really surprised me. I remember I went in being like, "Oh, this is gonna be awful!" Like, "Oh, right. it's gonna be so bad." And I was like, "Oh, actually, this is actually a really like a genuinely good sequel." Super mm-hmm. low expectations. Was pleasantly surprised. Um, yes, I think she definitely did this movie for a paycheck. I'm ha- I'm happy she was there. It kind of gave the movie a little like star quality. No, totally. I can definitely agree with you on that. I will just mention it now. So I think she did not want to do this movie after Peter Crane got fired. Apparently, they only were able. So for him being there, I think. They only got three days worth of footage out of him being there 10 days. So that's not great. But he was he's a perfectionist. He was just he really wanted it to be good. And I think that's the only reason that Vera Miles was there. And because she had already signed the contract, she had to complete her her duties. But uh, yeah, I don't think she wanted to be in this movie after that, to be honest. But it is what it is. Indeed. But, you know, I'm glad she's there. And, you know it's 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 a fun time it's a fun time for sure agreed uh and then we also got to talk about the king rest in power my dude clue gulliger 
as Mr. Fairchild, I guess, in this oh, film. Uh, daddy. He is daddy because you do see him like having simulated sex in the beginning. <laughs> and I'm just like, listen, but he has recently passed away and it's very, very sad. Of course, some people are probably like, who? But then I'm like, uh, the dad from Nightmare on Elm Street 2 and the guy from Return to the Living Dead and like all of this stuff. Like, clearly, like, amazing. are you guys sleeping under a rock? Gosh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no. Oh my God, love him. We'll also talk about Return to the Living Dead uh, in this movie too because I have thoughts. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, uh, we have James Reed. He plays Peter, who I think is one of the um, frat guys who ends up getting killed in this movie. But I put in my notes already, but you know where he's from, right? Oh, um, yes. He is from... Tell, uh, t- oh, he's a... he's a uh, uh, What's his name? From Legally Blonde. Uh, her dad. Yes. Her dad, dad yes. Legally Blonde, yes. <laughs> yes, the guy from Legally Blonde. Yes, he's the dad of Elle Woods, who you says... Um, Harvard, Harvard. It's yes. just boring and serious, and you pumpkin are none of those things. Exactly, I love him. Uh, yes, he's also uh, not an, in not another teen movie. If you've ever seen that movie, oh when Preston's God. gonna have the party or whatever, or Prescott is gonna have the party, he's Prescott's dad or whoever. So like, you see this whole tracking shot with him and the mom, and it's this guy. So I just think that's very funny. If y'all have not watched um, Not Another Teen Movie, you need to, because, I mean, if you didn't already think Chris Evans is super hot, this oh movie will just reinforce that or make you just, oh my God, oh my God, the whipped mm-hmm. cream, mm, mama. Yeah, it's very, very reverent and it's really stupid, but I unabashedly kind of enjoy it, <laughs> like, honestly, like, and yeah. I also think the castings in it are really fun. Like, I love that Lace Chabert is, like, Jennifer Love Hewitt's character and they were literally on a TV show together. So, like, I just think that's very funny. And, like, the little brother from Bring It On plays, like, the Jim... Uh, whatever the fuck his name's character from American Pie. I just think there are some fun little casting things in here. Like Jamie Presley's there. Like, really? Like, what the, how could you not yeah, stand? I consider it like one of the, it's like one of the last good, like parody movies of that time. I period. agree. And that's something being said, because I feel like this and scary movie are pretty much the same. I don't see them that different from one another. I don't think one is better than the other or anything. Um, but as parody goes, it goes downhill after this. So, but some people think that America, the not another team movie is that, which I'm just like, yeah, but have you seen another game movie? Like girl, mm, mm. Oh, have you seen any of the other movie movies like Epic movie and um, disaster movie, movie, disaster movie, which, Oh my God, the pun, right. It writes that joke writes itself. I can't anyway. Uh, and then uh, one of our last people we have is uh, Chris Bradley. He plays uh, Chad, another one of the guys that dies. Uh, he's had a fun little kind of career. Um, he, I think, mostly would be known for waxwork. Have you seen waxwork before? I haven't. I've seen the poster so many times, but I've never actually watched it. Mm-hmm, yeah. So there's him. You know, he's there. Uh, then we also have like uh, Marilyn Kagan, who plays Marsha, who we love Marsha, of course. She didn't have much of an acting career, but we'll talk a little bit about her. But, you know, she's in here. Hunter Tylo is another one um, who plays Allison. Uh, she didn't have much of like a big film career, but she's actually more of a soap star. She's gone on to do soap operas. And I found out this fun little tidbit about her. She actually was apparently going to be on melrose place also oh but they fired her because she was pregnant and she sued um uh she sued uh abc and uh aaron spelling's production company and i think she won or they settled out of court but yeah huh, that's interesting that, it, it makes sense for her to be on to melrose place for sure um that that just tracks for me but and also this is the same person who literally when she was younger just looked like nancy allen she just looks like her I don't know how to explain it, but it she just does. It, it is insane how it is. It's 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 crazy how much she looks like her. Like seriously, and I and I hate saying that because I'm like you know oh well blah, blah blah. But I was like no, when she was younger, she really did look like her. Like, I just don't know how to explain it. Like it just is okay. Just deal with it. <laughs> you know. I also love Heidi in this movie too. I think she's serving looks, but she only ever did this movie, so good for her but yeah so that's a little bit about our cast again a lot of these people i think were like 
first timers this is introducing daphne zaniga so this is like her first movie she ever did so you know i just think that's always very fun and as we stated already like this was uh so a little bit about the film so it was shot in dallas texas which is interesting because you don't get a whole lot of things actually shot in texas so it's always nice to kind of see that texas chainsaw massacre wow Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, Richard Linklater stuff. Uh, so like Days of Confuse and Slacker and all that. I think we're also shot in Texas. All that kind of thing. But, you know, yeah, it initially had Peter Crane at the helm. Peter Crane is actually British. Um, I mean, he did a couple things like he did a movie called Hunted Assassin and also this th- movie called Moments. He also did some early to late, I think late 70s, like TV shows and stuff. Um, so he did do some of that, which was cool, but again, he got fired and then Larry Stewart took over. And so the Dallas market center, um, which is a like wholesale trade center, pretty much like a big fucking mall, whatever the fuck this thing is, uh, pretty much is what they used for this. And then also Southern Methodist university is the primary shooting location, uh, for the university scenes. So I think this mall might still be around. I don't think it has necessarily, Oh, this, this was actually do you know a fun little thing about this mall um no but i know it's like mul- it's like five stories high and that this movie convinces us that they only need one security guard yes but i just found this out from wikipedia uh this center uh so this big big mall was the destination of one john f kennedy uh when he was on his way to there and then something oh. happened oh, um, oh wow. yeah so they were literally on their way to this place this big like trade center place and then a little a little thing happened so that sucks <laughs> um yeah, not to laugh but it's that's true all right then yeah uh he was gonna give a speech to 2600 people at this sold out luncheon in the grand courtyard and that is what happened with that but it's still around you know i guess it's like a big ass like i think there's like a uh like a there's like a public transit uh stop there um there's a place called trademark there's a couple different things i wonder if a trademark you can get trade hmm i hmm, uh, go find out you know go see i guess so uh but yeah so the initiation was given a regional staggered release by new world pictures because listen new world pictures made some cool movies and that's great i don't know how good they were at business because they folded like multiple times before they actually really folded (laughs) like they were always on the cusp in a way it is what it is you know fine (laughs) you know i'm sure they 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 had fun along the way they made some studs they made some hot hits you know yeah Totally. Uh, But yeah, so a little bit about the development of the movie. Uh, So screenwriter uh, Charles Pratt Jr., he wrote the script after being asked to produce a low-budget horror movie for the executive producers Jock Gaynor and Bruce Lansbury and the um, producer Scott Winart for New World Pictures. While writing the screenplay, Pratt deliberately incorporated soap opera elements into the subplots involving the Fairchild's family history as he was inspired by the genre at the time. There you, you go. Know, it tracks. I mean, th- with the twist ending and the kind of melodrama <laughs> oh, of the yes. family, it definitely is like a little... It de- it, uh, uh, yes. Okay, so we yeah. weren't crazy for thinking that. We were not crazy for thinking this. Like, yeah. Uh, and according to Pratt, he initially cobbled together the concept of the sorority initiation pledge taking place within a department store, but the concept had to be reworked when they weren't able to find find a suitable location um, to shoot this at. So Daphne Zaniga they was actually cast. They couldn't find a Macy's or a JC Penny. I guess not. <laughs> like, they couldn't find that. They just had to find this big ass like trade center. <laughs> so, okay. Daphne Zaniga had been cast in this role following her minor role in the dorm that dripped blood. So again, they gave her the introducing kind of like um, credit. And she was actually a student at UCLA at the time being cast. She has said, quote, it was a great part. I got to play twins. We'll get to that. A good sister and an evil sister. 
spoiler alert it's fine i got shot on the back one on screen it was a pretty heavy for a first role uh and the majority of the supporting actors were just local people from the dallas fort worth area including hunter tylo and joy jones um allison and heidi respectively who are both going to brookhaven college and vera miles as we stated already who is known for being lila crane was cast as the mother of zuniga's character um however she was not impressed by the screenplay she agreed to be in this after having um Peter Crane's support, but he got fired and she was not exactly happy with this. And so the initiation shows. And, and it, it shows. shows. It does show. <laughs> Uh, this was filmed on location in Fort Worth and Dallas, Texas over an approximately 30 day period um, in the summer of 1983. This commenced with director um, Crane at the helm of this. After several days of shooting, though, the Schedule had already fallen behind, leading to Crane being fired and replaced with Larry Stewart, who did the rest of the film. The difference in technique and style between the two directors account for slight aesthetic differences in some of the um, sequences. According to the writer, Charles Pratt Jr., um, Crane was employing more experimental like camera techniques, like close-ups and point-of-view shots. So maybe that's a lot of what we get from that. Um, whereas Stewart, who is primarily a TV director, as I said, um, used a lot more of a like conventional style akin to that medium. And many of the early point of view shots that were in this, as well as like the sequences set in the um, psychiatric hospital in the beginning, are all done by Crane. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, not knowing knowing that in, um, piece of trivia, and then rewatching the movie, it really it really does it it just makes sense because like you are like oh wow this is really cool and then you notice at some point like mm -hmm. there's kind of like weird camera angles and the pov stuff it just kind of just stops yes and i think that's when it kind of that, that, that's like that's my one one of my one complaints of the movie is that right. the middle section is especially boring and i think yeah. it's also because it's a lot of just cut you know like shoulder medium shot you know all that just it's just not that, really that interesting yeah, I agree for sure. Uh, the multi-level World Trade Center building of the Dallas um, Market Center, as I stated, is where the Fairchild Department Store is. Um, and the crew shot um, during evenings while the building was closed. Southern Methodist University used for the campus, um, while the Dream Labs sequences uh, were shot in an abandoned Holiday Inn hotel, where the production design had refitted a maid's closet to appear as the laboratory. So that's kind of fun. It's, this they had an abandoned. They had an empty hotel, and they couldn't just you know have him own a hotel instead. That could have been the initiation. I know, right? Like that very well could have been. Like that would have been also interesting. But so the initiation uh, first screened in the U.S. in the spring of 1984 with showings in Lexington, Kentucky, uh, Philadelphia, and it also apparently opened in Silver Spring, Maryland. That's fun. Um, that not really near me that's more south but okay in some midwestern cities such as bloomington um illinois it was paired as a drive-in double feature with the texas chainsaw massacre which kind of is funny because they were both shot in texas it was also released several months later in baltimore hey and the los angeles times reported a tentative autumn release of this film in um la and in several southern states um so southern U.S. cities like um, Shreveport, Pensacola, and Jackson. Um, this opened in December of 1984. And this film was largely overshadowed by, you want to take a guess at what it was overshadowed by? Let's see, 1984. So I'm assuming a little film called Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah. So it was definitely, and it also, uh, also this came out. Also deals with dreams. That, yes. They just really, poor, poor, poor. Poor initiation. Poor initiation. It screened sporadically throughout the country, doing like one or two week runs. And it um it was past the MPAA, you know, but the British uh Board of Film Classification, so the BCFC. Uh, BBFC, sorry, uh, cut nearly a minute of gore, specifically from Hunter Tylo's uh, murder scene that happens. Mm -hmm. So the critical response and legacy of this film. So Joe Baltake of Philadelphia Daily News wrote that the film was quote, convoluted contemporary and evil. This is a Freudian slip of a horror film, far more complex than truly terrifying. 
it is a little convoluted. I will give him that. But Rick Lyman of the Philadelphia Inquirer likened the film to its contemporary, quote, sorority girl slasher films. There you go. Concluding, all of this is tied up in a surprise demon, uh, denouement that's about as surprising as, well, a knock-knock joke. Uh, the Baltimore Evening Sun's Lou Cedrone uh, wrote that the film was, quote, not so gory as most of the slice and dice genre, comparing it to Friday the 13th and Sleepaway Camp, um, but added, quote, the initiation may be a little better than similar features, if only because it is less bloody. In a subsequent review, this uh, critic also stated uh, they characterize this as a Friday the 13th clone and added, quote, Vera Miles and Clue Gulliger are performers caught in this hapless mess. And then Candace Russell of the South Florida Sun Sentinel gave this film one and a half out of four stars, referring to it as an uncomfortable pastiche of scenes we've never seen before and likened elements of it to Brian De Palma's sisters from 1973. Do you have anything to say about those people who said something about it? Every time I read like a, a negative review from people from the 80s, I'm just like... Did we watch the same movie? Like, what? Wait, were were people just too smart back then? I just like, I'm like, it's a dumb slasher movie, and y'all are like, I know, it's evil. What? I know. You're just like, oh, okay, <laughs> like, fine. Um, following the first DVD release in 2002, Film Threat Which gave it an has unfavorable, a terrible po- uh, cover art. I hate it's just DVD saying cover art. <laughs> Uh, this had an unfavorable review from Film Threat writing, quote, the initiation is the latest forgotten horror film to receive the Anchor Bay DVD treatment. Um, and I'd be at loss to tell you why. Uh, film, film film School Rejects, however, said the film, quote, had the hallmarks of being an awful movie without being an awful movie. It's fun. And that should count for something. There you go. I like that. Eric Snyder, fil- writing for Film.com in 2012, gave the film a negative review, calling it, quote, a bad movie with bad ideas that are badly executed. While TV Guide summarized the film as boring slasher stuff, noting that top build Vera Miles and Clue Gulliger barely appear in the film, which would be a terrifically dreadful double bill with the similar the house the dorm that dripped blood also featuring zuniga brian collins who was writing for the alamo drafts house film journal uh birth movies death uh noted that the film may be worth a look for slasher aficionados it's far from a perfect film but there are some unusual elements to it that give it enough personality to overcome its somewhat sluggish pace and tv movie uh, esque production and dread central's anthony arrego uh observed in 2016's uh in a review he did um he said quote a surprising amount of character depth on display here more so than similar pictures of the era and then uh finally in legacy of blood a comprehensive guide to slasher movie uh jim Harper, who is the writer, called the film, quote, a lackluster effort that never quite lives up to the abilities of its cast. Further noting, even with the soap opera ending, the film isn't entirely successful, mostly because of the terrible script. There's a wealth of unnecessary jargon and cheap dialogue, not to mention some notable inconsistencies. Zuniga does her best to rise above the bad material and turns in a great performance, but Gulliger and Miles sleepwalk through their parts. Horror film scholar Adam Rakoff um, alternately alternately notes in his fi- um, book, Going to Pieces, The Rise and Fall of the Slasher Film, um, that, quote, despite its proclivity for laughable dialogue and silly plot twists, the initiation manages to be a fairly entertaining and occasionally frightening movie. And because of this, it has been able to gain this kind of cult following. And Adam Rakoff, I will side with you on this because I, I agree. <laughs> like Same. you know i totally agree yeah i will never claim that this movie is like super super good however i think if you want kind of a dumb slasher like this is definitely kind of up that alley so i absolutely you know. it's a, it's a deep cut it's you know it's if you want to go a little deeper see one that you maybe haven't seen before it's, yeah. it's a fun watch it's a fun watch i agree i agree so we've gone over, you know, some of the cast, the crew, and some of the production of the movie. But let's go a little bit into this. We already already had some spoilers anyway, but we're going to go a little bit different in this, okay? Um, so let's let's 
dig into a little bit of this uh this little plot so Pickens, I guess if you had to explain to somebody like what this movie is about, like if you wanted to do an elevator pitch of the movie, how would you tell somebody what the initiation is about? Picture it. Sorority, titties. Um, but there's a convoluted uh, family history. But there's also um, a study about dreams and what do they actually mean. But it's also a mall movie. But it's also a slasher movie. But there's also a twist ending. There you go. I mean, that's fine. That works. Like, absolutely. Picture it. <laughs> like, it's all good. Uh, yeah. I guess if I had to explain this. Um, yeah. So this movie is about a young lady named Kelly Fairchild. First off, what a name. I love Great that name. name. Great name. So good. Um, so Kelly has gone through some trauma in her life. I guess she experienced um, seeing a man be burned when she was a kid. And this is left her with what, seeing her seeing what we think are her parents fucking. Yes, exactly. So this has left her with some trauma. Trauma. Anyway, so she ends up trauma. going to college. Trauma. Yes. Yes. Rushing a sorority, Delta Rho Chi, who again never will die there you go but yeah so she goes to the sorority and um but she's having these reoccurring nightmares pretty much and um they are also in their hell week as we may have talked about on the previous show about uh sorority horror hell week is kind of the closing of um it's like the closing part of like the rush process where they decide whether they want you in the sorority or not i guess and normally this has to do with like a prank you have to pull or something like this at least the logic that this movie is telling us essentially it's basically hazing but okay it is convoluted the whole the whole yeah. premise is just as much as I love the fact it takes place in the mall and I love the mall atmosphere that they're in, right? it did not need to be in this movie. I know. It is very odd where I'm just like, why did it have to be in a mall? But the reason it's in a mall, which we'll get to. So, like, yeah. So this movie was pretty much she's like... She's a fair um, child. That's she's why. a fair child. Yes. <laughs> pretty much like she goes to college and all this is happening, right? In the meantime, there's also like some killer that is like on the loose that escapes from a sanatorium and is now killing people. And so that's also happening in the background of this film. But yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty much it. Let, let's let's go into again. We're going back to Wikipedia and we'll get a little bit of our plot um, from there. And then we can kind of talk a little bit about what we thought of just some of the scenes and all this. So here's my dramatic reading. Since childhood, college student Kelly Fairchild, played by Daphne Zuniga, has suffered from a reoccurring nightmare in which a strange man is burned alive in her childhood home. The nightmare began when she suffered amnesia after sustaining a head injury at nine. Apparently, she fell out of a tree. So, hoping to unravel the nightmare's meaning, in she pitches a term project to Peter. Okay, so that's Peter. Got it. So, uh, that is the dad from Legally Blonde, uh, the graduate assistant in her psychology seminar about it. Also, by the way, he is getting a degree in parapsychology. Bitch, where? That's a pseudoscience. It's just, it, 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 yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> also, he's just such a useless character. Because do, does yeah. he? Does he like just kind of disappear once the mall stuff happens? Like he kind of does, to be honest. Yeah, with you. it's like, very weird. Vera Mills comes and like, into, uh, yeah, but we're we're getting ahead. We're getting ahead. Yeah. We're getting ahead of ourselves. Anyway, so uh, Peter agrees to perform a sleep study on Kelly, but her mother Frances, played by Vera Miles, subsequently forbids it. Meanwhile, at a psychiatric hospital miles away, several patients escape and a nurse is murdered. Francis is notified of this incident by phone and she informs Kelly's father, Dwight, played by Clue Gulliger. She, Kelly, is preparing to partake in this sorority's uh, initiation ritual, which entails her and a group of other pledges breaking into the multi-level department store of her father, Fairchild's, um, after hours and stealing the night porter's or the night watchman's uh, uniform. Kelly, her All best friend Marsha. Exactly, yes. Um, and then roommates, Allison and Beth. Hi, uh, Hunter Tyler plays Allison. I don't remember who Beth is, but okay. Um, they're the four main pledges. And on the night of the initiation, uh, Dwight departs for a business trip, which we will get to it. But he is brutally stabbed outside of his car with a hand rake. That's what it's called. Um, before being decapitated. And the murderer leaves in Dwight's car with his corpse in the trunk. 
Just before Kelly and the other pleasures arrive at the department store, the night watchman is murdered while doing rounds, and Beth decides to quit. And we never get to see him naked, and he's actually kind of hot. He is kind of hot, and we do never get to see him naked. It's very unfortunate, because we see titties in, you know, Bush, so, but whatever. This was not made for us pickings. It's fine. This leaves because Beth decided to quit. Uh, this leaves Kelly, Marsha, and Allison alone, and the three split up, and Kelly heads to the lounge upstairs to retrieve one of the uniforms uh, from the night walk. Meanwhile, uh, Megan, who's the head sorority sister, lets co-eds Chad, Ralph, and Andy break into the store to scare the pledges. And after, shortly after, though, Andy is killed with a hatchet, and Megan is shot to death with a bow and arrow. And then Chad and Ralph um, successfully scare Kelly and Marsha by hiding in a dressing room. And after uniting with Allison, all five attempt to leave the store, but are now locked inside. Meanwhile, back at the campus, Peter and his colleague Heidi uh, come across uh, newspaper clippings detailing the uh, fire that Kelly describes in her dreams. The article reveals that the burning man's identity is Jason Randall, who was a floor manager at the Fairchild um, department store, who was at one time married to Francis Vera Miles. Peter suspects that Jason is, in fact, Kelly's biological father, and that her nightmare is a memory of him being burned in an altercation with Francis's lover, Dwight, uh, who subsequently raised Kelly as his own daughter. A recent article on the inmates revolt at the hospital reveals that Jason is a house is a groundskeeper uh, on there. And to he's among the prisoners who have escaped. Peter then drives to the Fairchild's residence to notify uh, Francis of his discoveries. Meanwhile, back at the mall, Allison and Chad wander around the store together. Um, while Chad is in the bathroom, Allison discovers the body of the night watchman, followed by Chad's corpse in a bathroom stall. And a traumatized Allison locates Kelly, who instructs her to hide at the security desk on the ground floor. Kelly enters the bathroom, sees Chad's body, as well as her name written in blood on the mirror. Meanwhile, Allison at the security desk is brutally stabbed to death. Unfortunate. By Hunter Tylo. So then Ralph and Marsha, because this whole thing is Marsha is a virgin throughout the whole movie, they have sex in a retail display uh, bed before Ralph is shot dead with the harpoon gun. And Marsha flees through the store and is met by Kelly. They seek safety inside of a freight elevator, but is soon infiltrated by the killer who drags Marsha into the elevator shaft. R.I.P. Marsha, we love you. Kelly escapes and flees into the store's boiler room where she encounters Jason who she assumes to be the killer um just because maybe he looks weird he's burned that's unfortunate but okay he pursues her jason his name's jason yes you're right girl what did i say oh my god (laughs) um he pursues her to the roof where he um she bludges him with a pipe uh causing him to fall to the ground below and then Peter and Francis uh, arrive at the store and they find Jason lying on the uh, ground, clinging to life. Inside, Peter sees whom he believes to be Kelly um, standing in the foyer of the uh, store and he embraces her before she then stabs him in the stomach. Oh, that's and, right. He isn't. Yeah, he does show back up. I'm, I yeah. guess he does. But yeah. Whatever. Yeah. No. Um, <laughs> Kelly then stumbles upon the scene and she is faced with a reflection of herself, her disturbed twin sister, Terry, who has been institutionalized since childhood when Francis left her mother and married, uh, left her father and married Dwight. Um, and um, of whom Kelly has no memory of. So just as Terry is about to murder Kelly, she is shot to death by Francis and the film ends as a wounded Peter is taken away in an ambulance while Kelly stares at her mother in disbelief. And then that's the end of the film pretty much. And that is the plot of the initiation. (laughs) When you you actually read it out loud, it, it actually, you do realize, like, oh my gosh, so much does actually happen in this it's movie. It's so much. Like, there's so much going on. Like, oh my God. Like, because you do have these, like, A and B plots and all that. And not saying that this doesn't one has necessarily a, B, happen. C all the way down to Z almost. Oh my God. Yes. It's crazy. Uh, but yeah, there's a whole lot going on. It's the twist of the end where it is the killer twin. And that's who has been behind this whole thing because i guess we really would have thought it was like the burned up jason guy like we just thought it was him i guess he's the red hearing but then when you watch Mm -hmm. it it makes so much sense because there's like a lot of mirrors and like 
reflections yeah. and just all that stuff. Yeah, no, totally. And just a lot of that kind of thing going on. And and yeah, it's it's very interesting. Um, I have heard this kind of compared. I don't know if you would compare it as well. There's a little bit of a comparison to Happy Birthday to Me. Thoughts? Oh, feelings? yeah, absolutely. Um, I will say, though, this 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 does make more sense than Happy Birthday to Me, because yes. I every time I actually happy birthday to me works is every time I watch it, I always forget who the killer is because right. it makes so much, it makes zero sense. And I'm like, Oh, right. It is the, it is that person. And of course, because it makes zero sense. Yeah, absolutely. And there's just a lot going on and happy birthday to me. It's still kind of fun, but like, yeah, there's a lot going on there too. Also, uh, I already talked about this with you over Instagram chat, um, but watched Thanksgiving. This uh, it was on Netflix and Fantastic film. Pretty decent. I do need to rewatch it because I took mushrooms and went to go see it. Oh. And 10 out of 10 would not recommend. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, let's just say it got a little too real sometimes, but I really got, I really like the scream aspect of it. It felt like yeah. a, it felt like a, it felt more like a 90s scream movie than like the newer scream movies. And I, I really dug it. Eli, I this did. is an Eli Roth doing good. We do good job, Eli Roth. This one. Yes, because listen, I, I when was he just does bad, that. he does bad. But when he does yeah. good, he does really good. No, he did. Yeah, because this is like one of the only E. R. E. Roth movies I can even say like, yes, you should see this because it's ridiculous. I only say that because there is like a literal like homage to Happy Birthday to me, like seriously in Thanksgiving. So it's just very fun to see him pull those references for sure. And they're making a sequel. So I'm super excited. I'm super excited too. I think I, I would be interested again. Don't think I want to see it in theaters because spyglass is being shady, but you know, I would stream it somewhere, you know, for, for whatever. So cool. Not until they, uh, I'm just glad I finally have a Thanksgiving movie to watch. You know, we really don't have a lot of them. <laughs> I know. I mean, we all love blood rage, obviously, but like, you know, Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Speaking of another Oscar, she speaking of another Oscar winning performance. Oh my gosh. I mean, really? I mean, truly like Louise Lasser, like, come on now. Like, uh, amazing. <laughs> like, just, just sitting, just her sitting in front of the open refrigerator, eating the mashed potatoes, drinking a bottle of wine. It's just, oh my gosh, it's iconic. <laughs> oh, don't worry. We're cover we're we're gonna cover it. It's it's all good. We have I must. I have to at some point. But yeah. So I mean, like, but that's the plot of of the movie, pretty much. Pretty straightforward. Not really even that straightforward, but that's what it is. Um now what I kind of wonder from you, Pickens, is from my beautiful dramatic reading, um, do you have any particular like favorite scenes of this movie that you like? Yeah, like I pretty much when I watch the movie, I pretty much watch the very beginning and then like I fast forward. I honestly fast forward through all the dream stuff because it's 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 very it, there's a there are very boring long scenes and then I go right to the mall. So I really the beginning up to her dad, her uh, supposed dad's death and then the, all the mall stuff. And then I kind of just skip out the middle because it's just it's it's kind of the same conversations over and over again. I'm having these dreams. Mirrors scare me. Oh, my God. Let's talk about the psychology of dreams. And it's like, I don't care. Let's get to the killing. I know. I'll also throw in that I do like their discovery stuff. Like I like when um like uh Heidi with her cute glasses and everything has done all this research. I do like that part because it like makes them do something. But as I as you stated already, it is kind of boring that they're doing this like fucking dream shit. I'm just like, okay, cool. I guess like, nah, all right. Like, you know, but, uh, because I do think like the slasher stuff in the mall is very fun as well. I will also say I do kind of like the party scene in this movie. It's not as good as some of the other party scenes we've had, but this one is kind of fun. It is. I actually will say like, cause I, I think it is because this one is a little different from the other. There is a lot of character development in this movie. So you do like, have fun with the characters and you do like kind of like them so it just yeah. yeah like it's more yeah no totally i i can agree with that i do think there's a little bit of that i like her um 
like she has this like little leather like uh, outfit going on at this party uh for some her reason the graduate. And this, her her outfits are on point in this movie I, I will say she looks incredible she does look so good oh my god i love it but yeah so it's like that and what what i was saying earlier about return of the living dead which is just funny because clue gulliger is in this movie also that movie did not exist at this time so i just think it's kind of interesting but for some reason marcia is dressed i don't know who she's dressed up as she literally looks like okay she doesn't look exactly like her because they don't look the same but she looks like trash from return of the living dead and i don't oh know why God. oh <laughs> like, she does with like the red hair and like just her yeah. outfit i'm like what were we doing here like what is this like i don't know the future. Man. they really did because i was like because she's wearing a wig so i'm just like i just think it's like so funny i'm just like what's going on over there also the guy that she's with um is dressed up as a literal penis so that's always fun well I mean, it's because he's a dick yeah he's a dick there you go yeah it's just like so fucking weird <laughs> but uh but yeah i mean like i'm trying to think of if i have any particular scenes that are like stand out to me like i said i think like the discovery of everything is always a really interesting one um and also i do like i like a lot of the mall stuff i feel like the mall stuff is just like where i kind of get really, into yeah especially when allison's like uh roller skating like down the hall yeah it's like kind of, you know and there is a, there are like actually like really creepy shots like in the dark mm-hmm. like department store rooms and everything it's actually yeah. it, gets, it does get a little creepy like during that part yeah no totally like i i would absolutely agree with that um and, and then also like even though yes the twist is kind of weird as hell i like the twist like i think it is that perfect soap opera twist like yes of course she had an evil sister she knew nothing about and has been killing everyone this whole time like obviously malignant who like you know it's all good like it's oh just oh my god that movie is so good i love it is, it it is so good i watched that on hbo when it first came out and that shit was bomb go watch malignant please oh it's so good I just love it because it, it it it's stupid and it knows it's stupid and it oh, absolutely. celebrates being stupid. Uh yeah, it's great. When she falls through the roof or whatever. Oh my like, gosh. Huh? Just just the, all of just the oh my the oh my gosh, that oh my gosh, just oh it the kung fu of it all, the the love letter to Giallo. It's just oh yeah. <laughs> It's a fun time. It's it's enjoyable. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but this is not a malignant podcast, but listen, you know. But uh, yeah, no, I, I do think like those are kind of those scenes that I really like and are just enjoyable, if anything. Like, I do think like, I think where this, I think like you said a little earlier, I think this movie shines with like being able to look pretty decent on a low budget. Like, I think it looks nice. Like even you watching it on Tubi, like is it's only ever a 2k. I think that's what you have. And we can talk a little bit about the special features on your Blu-ray, but like, you know, um, even when you can get it for free, like it still looks pretty decent. And I really like that. And there are some cool shots in it as well, but do you want to talk a little bit about, um, do you have anything to say about your arrow release Blu-ray that, you want anybody to know about yeah. or whatever first of all i was just so um i was so like and i was shocked when it like was announced like I, but it makes sense because i'm like oh yeah basically everything arrow puts out is just great the the transfer is beautiful really really good special features I, ha- I haven't really delved too much in the special features yet there's there, it's kind of just like some there's just basically some interviews basically so it's just and none of none of but no one like major like i think it's uh god one of the guys does it and um and one of the actresses but it's not none of one major so it's just kind of eh. and then there's like a commentary that's like by a it's like not even by anyone from the movie like they're like a podcast or they're like fans of the movie so it's a fan commentary which I like to hear what I have to say about the movie. I don't need other people. You know, no one else wants to hear me talk about it over a movie, right? So, eh, but it, the transfer is great. Awesome. Love it. Yeah, I love that for you. Yeah, totally. Like, 
Yeah, and I think if anything, I don't actually have an Arrow release, but I need to work on on getting one. Did you get it They're straight from it. Arrow? Uh, I believe I did. If not, it was at a, some DVD store, but I'm pretty sure I, I think, no, I did. No, I did buy it from Arrow because they were doing a sale and I like racked up basically. But you should definitely get an Arrow release. They are, they are worth the money, in my opinion, because mm-hmm. they actually, they're like the modern day uh anchor bay like they give you they give you the features mama yeah that's good i like that for sure uh also fun little thing because we already talked about a few things of this but marilyn kagan who plays marcia in this movie unfortunately has since passed away um so very sad but she actually went on to have a top rated radio show on kfi in los angeles she became a licensed clinical social worker and she took calls from her listeners and answered their therapeutic questions so marcia ended up doing good in the end so there there you That's go. Awesome. Good for her. She yeah. is I, she is like one of my favorite characters. And she I actually do like I remember when I first watched it, I was like, no, don't kill Marsha. Because you thought she was gonna make it to the end. She was kind of right there with her. And then mm-hmm. she gets dragged off. I'm like, damn it. Yeah, I think I I also I was also wondering like why is it you liked Marsha all this? You know, like why was it you liked her? But like no i completely Uh, get it yeah she's like she's like a little bit of an underdog because i mean let's face it kelly fairchild's beautiful she's gorgeous Mm -hmm. um she's kind of like that cool girl she's a little nerdy she you know she's a tragic backstory which we come to Mm -hmm. find out she there's a reason why she's a virgin she's not technically a virgin because she was molested as a child um which also very heavy for a a slasher yeah that came out of nowhere in a way Mm -hmm. yeah yeah. yeah. And, you know, she's just she just wants, you know, some love. She just wants she just has ambitions. She wants yeah. to get her college degree. God damn it. And then it was cut short. Literally. I know. I know. Yeah. I think that's what's really interesting about the character of Marsha is like she just felt very like just normal because as you said kelly is so well she comes from privilege and she's like rich obviously rich um rich oh that house (laughs) i'm i want that i want to live in that house so bad i understand like it's nice like just uh amazing but like yeah no i i uh rich she's you know beautiful of course she's daphne zuniga um hunter tylo also very attractive like all of this so i think a lot of folks maybe they just kind of latch on with marcia because she's just like you know nice bubbly like she's fun it did come out of nowhere where she talks about like her her child sex uh, sexual trauma um and that's just like really kind of out of left field in a weird way it but really it kind of, is yeah but it kind of then makes it interesting of like she's kind of virgin shamed in a way through the movie and it's like well maybe she didn't ever want to say anything and you know I don't know. It's just like this whole thing of like, maybe there's a reason you shouldn't just like do that. And Honestly. again, that goes back to, you know, and how kudos, sororities will do that. Kudos to the writers though, for making her boyfriend, like actually like a sympathetic person. Like he's mm-hmm. like, Oh, I mean, they end up having sex, but like, at least it's right. like, you know, he's like, I'm going to show you good consensual sex. Yay. Mm-hmm. We, we like yeah. that. We like that. Cause it could have gone in a more, it was the 80s. They could have gone in much yes. different directions. I agree. I agree. For sure. For sure. I mean, if I don't know if there's much to break down with these characters, but I mean, maybe a little bit. Um, you know, do you have any thoughts on like Kelly Fairchild, except that she's just beautiful, I guess? Like, do you have anything to kind of talk with her about? She's beautiful. She's rich. I will be completely honest. Daphne is a little, she is a little one note kind of. Mm-hmm. She's a little like uh like a little like above it in a way i don't know i think she kind of was i don't know wasn't the best performance in the world yeah. and maybe that's also why i like marcia because marcia gives i think really honestly marcia give she and um megan i think are the only two that actually give a really good performance sure the other, I, can like, I can i'll always never forget the 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 insane asylum nurse is probably one of the worst actresses I've ever seen in a movie. Oh God. Why is that? Why do we say that? She, the way she's like, she's like, what are you doing in there? Get out of here. Oh my, you know, oh, just, yeah. Yeah. Mm, fair. Very fair. Yeah. And you know, if anything, like, 
Yeah, no, I, I totally can understand what you're saying because there's only so much in terms of that. And like you even said, like Peter is like kind of a throwaway. Like he comes back in the end, of course, but like you're just like, okay, teacher, I guess. Like not even teacher, but like he's yeah. a grad assistant. Weird, so he is in a weird love yeah. interest. Yeah. <laughs> It is kind of weird because I'm just like, he is like at least a graduate student, I guess, but I'm just like, and then also we go back to him having a pseudo psychology. It's not real. That's not real. It's like, you can't get a parapsychology degree. Like, that's not real science. Like, I'm sorry. Like, whatever. It's anyway, but yeah. So I think we talked a little bit earlier about it. So I do think there are some good things in this film. I think we may have touched on it a little bit, but what do you think, what do you have like negatives of this movie? Like, what do you think maybe doesn't yeah. work in the film? I mean, as I said, like definitely like the dream stuff. I think it's just, it's, yeah. it, it doesn't necessarily need to leave the movie, but it could have been like one or two scenes. And I feel like it's like a, it's like a good 15 minute portion of the movie. Right. Of just, and it's kind of the same thing over and over again. She's having the dreams. She's talking about them. They're analyzing it. The only mm-hmm. one time it gets interesting is when she goes under hypnosis and like they're trying to get her out of it. And her they're like, Kelly Fairchild, wake up. Kelly Fairchild, wake up. And her mother just goes, Randall. It's Kelly Randall. You know, yeah, just, right. Um, so yeah, that yeah. doesn't work. Um, and also, I mean, as much as I love the mall, as much as we love the mall scenes, the mall mm-hmm. scene, there's, there's, it is the dumbest, dumbest, like, like dumbest reason like even okay let's just okay so she's she's her dad owns the building it's the fairchild mall whatever so they could have done so many other things besides let's steal the night man's clothes they could have been like you gotta there you gotta steal something or you gotta you know vandalize i don't know they could have had way more fun with it and they just chose the most ridiculous convoluted reason to go into the mall which again and we said this earlier this thing is gigantic. It is a it's yes. a convention center. It is one one nightman, one guy. That's it. That's all we need. You know, meh. Right, exactly. Like it's just like, oh, it's so weird how that works. But yeah, no, I I do think like this movie, uh, in terms of what maybe doesn't work, I think the writing could have been better in terms of this. Um, the script is a little lacking for sure, and I think like. Performance wise, I think Marsha does a good job. And I guess Vera Miles and Clue Gulliger do a pretty decent job. However, I feel like you could definitely tell that Vera Miles could give a fuck less about this. Um, that, but every time you I know. watch that scene, it's like, I think she's just sitting at the table by herself pouring her scotch. Yes. I, I'm just convinced that, that that was just improvised. I'm just convinced she was just like, I'm in this fucking movie. Oh, God. <laughs> no, totally. Like, yeah, because some of the other acting maybe wasn't like the best. But again, I think like there is that kind of like there's the negatives there. Like I said, with the positives, which we already kind of talked about anyway. And if you wanted to add on, but like I think the positives of it are that it does look pretty decent in terms of cinematography. The just use of this in general of like having this kind of weird soap opera thing is kind of unique in a weird way um and i will always say that with this movie is that it may not be the best film in the world however it is not it's a unique movie it's interesting it is if unique. Anything. one of the big unique things i've that i always like that always like caught my attention on it. have you ever seen the prowler Yes. Oh, no, no, I haven't. I haven't. I thought oh, you said God. the mutilator. I thought you were thinking of that. Oh, no, no, not the mutilator, the prowler. So, you know, in this movie, like whenever the, somebody like the blood, is like shiny kind yes, of like it's yeah. shiny blood. The the only other movie I've ever seen that done is the, also the prowler. There's scenes okay. in the prowler where like this blood's shiny like that. It's a weird thing. Yeah. The Vaseline I not... on the camera or something. Like yeah. That. Totally right, right, right. I need to find out where the Plower Howler is. Uh, I need to find out where that's streaming because I have not oh, seen it. Oh yeah, I own it. Big shocker. It's it's honestly some of Tom Savini's best makeup work, in my opinion. Oh, bitch, it's on Tubi and Shutter. Oh, well, look at that. Oh, watch it. It is. It is seriously. It's really. It, that's another real. That's ooh. That's a. That's a really good one. 
Yeah, I'm going to watch it because I have not seen it. So maybe I really need to actually pull up on that. Okay, I'm going to pull up on it. Also, a little side note, fucking the mutilator. Like, that is where you're from, like near where you're not completely, but kind of sort of. That is a fucking ride, too. My God. Oh, yeah. And they're making a sequel. They're doing it, baby. They want to do it, man. One of my uh, one of my exes, uh, he is like friends with the director, actually. And like, of course, he is a huge mutilator fan um and like he like he actually hosted a uh screening of it like at the like where it was filmed um and i i don't know if he's how involved he is in it but i I think he encouraged him to get the sequel started or something yeah that's so funny how he would have been interested in that movie like that's so odd in a way but okay I'll, I'll buy it oh and my dad went to high school with, with one of the one of the guys in the movie um he has a weird name but uh the, yeah my dad went to high school with him oh cute love that yeah and it was just like so and in a way like it's funny that like you say like the prowler and like we bring up like mutilator and stuff because if i'm not mistaken the prowler was also shot like on location somewhere wasn't it like it was like it's, i don't remember it's exactly a, it's a it definitely is in New England because um, it's the whole thing. It's actually like a very like it's a more mature slasher movie. Um, it's I know it's like these college students are doing this like uh, dance. Mm-hmm. They're hosting a dance. And the, the last time it was done in it, New it Jersey. So, OK, that's was, yeah, New Jersey. Yeah. 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 So but it's it's really good, actually. It's one of my it's real. It's one, it's it's another like not really well known or like kind of more deep cut but it's really Mm -hmm. it's really good no totally and i think that kind of comes back to like the initiation because this movie does it was definitely shot on location in texas so like you know that kind of works with that but but yeah i think if anything like the positives of this movie i i was thinking of this what did i say in letterbox i will bring up my letterbox uh real quick i think i mentioned this on the last um the sorority episode but i think what i said is yeah this is so early 80s and i really enjoyed myself with it the effects the cheesy music and the twists like i definitely think that this movie if anything is something where if you are interested in 80s horror in particular it's a movie that's at least worth checking out and it is kind of an interesting it's an interesting departure it's something that you know you don't get to uh you don't it's something that I just think is underseen and a little underrated. I can't say it's like top flight or anything like that, but I would say I enjoyed myself generally. And yeah, I, I just think like, I'm glad that you were able to let me, you know, experience this and turn me on to it. If anything, I really like that because yeah, I, I think this movie is like, worth a it's a cheesy 80s horror movie but i'm okay with it being a cheesy 80s horror movie honestly um, yeah. yes i am a big i mean it's one of the, it's it i mean i don't recommend it to everyone that if, it, if someone says like oh, i love horror movies it's not my first one to recommend but like if mm-hmm. i find out they love slasher movies or 80s yeah. movies i'm like this is one you should check out you know you, that's what i always say like you know when you get past the friday the 13th the nightmare on elm streets you know and you kind of get dig down a little deeper you, you find some gems you do i absolutely believe that and i think yeah the initiation is definitely one of those um i also think like uh yeah like the mutilators are kind of another one that's sort of like that too and you know i just like that also in a way like we're able to have this kind of it's so cool that we can talk about these movies from a, a bygone era if anything i don't think we'll ever really get back to that unfortunately which is very sad but i do think like in a weird way i feel like 80s horror am i going on record and saying this but like i don't know like it's kind of one of my favorite parts of horror like i just think there's oh, a lot of cool shit going I don't think on that's a hot take at all i think like, it's, i mean because i mean there's a reason why we are talking about it still and like yeah you know, that's why, like, I mean, like, we'll watch anything nowadays. There's so many references to it. You know, yeah. like the synth soundtrack is coming back into style and like, you know, just the, the you can just see homages all over the place to it. It's just yeah. there's something about that time period. You know, the 80s is still 
you know, it's still, there's still stuff getting made about it to, to this day, you know? Yeah. And maybe because it was like, you know, kind of original and it was like, kind of like, a, mm-hmm. hey, we're, we're throwing stuff and seeing what sticks. Again, Hollywood producers, just start doing cocaine again, please. Can we just, just the Hollywood bit. industry, just, just a little bit, you know, not a, not a concern. Just go get one of Sarah Michelle Gellar's, um, you know, crucifixes yes, and just the, do the that cross. amount. And then just start writing some scripts and just... And producers join in so you'll throw money at it and then just let it happen. Yeah, because I just feel like, you know, because we're wrapping up a little bit as well. But like, you know, um, because there's not much else to talk about this movie with, you know, you should go fucking watch it. But like, uh, so it is on like Tubi pretty easily. Um, It shows up different places. I maybe would not like rent it for money, really. But like, if you Mm -hmm. find it for free go ahead like i would watch, watch it for it that free way. and if you like it then you know check out the arrow blu-ray that's my recommendation sure yeah, yeah i think you can find it on youtube pretty easy so that's cool too but yeah i think um back to the 80s horror thing or whatever like i don't know i just think like um it's me waxing poetic at this point about it but like i just think like in this genre i think that time you know for as much bullshit as there kind of was i guess i kind of liked the fact that there was that bullshit like you could have all of this stuff and it was kind of cool and you know like there is there was just so much there to kind of look for and to kind of make horror about if anything um right yeah yeah. i also think it's just I think they also like just were allowed to be stupid and dumb and like mm-hmm. you know because I think people were less cynical probably I think they were less people got cynical in the nineties I think you know people sure. were just they could just they just enjoyed things you know and they just like you know and it was fun because now you know every like even though like I think we are in another like kind of a new like golden or silver age of horror. There's mm-hmm. so many layers of like, you know, you have to pull back the layers of the bullshit and all the stuff. It's yeah. just like, you know, movies just need to be dumb again. And not like dumb and it's like in Transformers mm-hmm. dumb. It's just dumb. I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying. No, no. I think I get what you're saying because what it is is that I think in the 80s, yes. I think maybe some people were still cynical and I think people got more cynical in the 90s with Gen X and all. And I still love the 90s for some horror as well, but like, you know, whatever. But 80s It's growing just had, on me. It's growing it on me. I get it. I, I do like some 90s horror. It's pretty good. But like the, the 80s horror, I just think there was a lot going on. There was a lot of people just trying their best or just trying their hand at stuff, which was really cool. And, you know, I just think there was a lot of variety going on as well, which was really interesting is too and i think like you know we just don't have that as much now anymore um it's always about like what can we remake what can we like adapt from something or like which has always happened really but like you Uh, know yeah but it's happening a lot more now like and i think it's just more obvious like it's just coming up more and more and more and it's just Okay, original, please. Right. Would you want, uh, here's a question, would you want a remake of The Initiation? I mean, I'm at this point, like, you know, if you asked me, like, maybe 10 years ago, I would have been like, absolutely not. This is my child. Um, but, you know, at this point, I'm like, if you're going to remake it, yes, but, like, make it interesting like you know fix you should remake it to fix the problems of the original Mm -hmm. you should you know maybe add like a fun new element like i honestly think you know they could play with the twin thing a little bit more you know Mm -hmm. they could like really like you know keep you guessing like is she crazy is it a twin is like you know like show her killing people and like you know like have like this whole i can't trust you aspect to it i think it'd be interesting you know, and get more into the politics of sorority and Greek life, and yeah, and show the nightman naked. I want to see some dong. I know we need more dong in horror movies, like truly and utterly. Um, we just need more dong in movies. I agree, because obviously, equal opportunity. Like, I just want it. Like, sorry, but yeah, it's like just... we've seen boobs, we've seen butts. Let's see some dicks. It's fine. Exactly, exactly. But yeah, I just think like nowadays like we're just only so many things are working for me um and like and that's whatever but 
Yeah. Have you ever watched, um, have you seen the In Search of Darkness documentaries ever at all? Yes. I I mean, as much as I can, because they're like, what, three hours? It's, oh my God, they they're are, so long. They're so long. They're, they're really good. I love, I love those a lot. I love the poster art. There's yeah. actually also, there's a YouTube channel I just discovered called Horror Timelines. And he's actually oh, doing yeah. something following the 80s project. And he's literally watching every, as as many 80 like he's basically gonna he takes a year and he watches every single horror movie released in that year which i don't know how like i commend that man that is incredible right. and he's actually he's like reviewed some movies i didn't even know existed and they seem really yeah. cool and i want to check them out yeah check out horror timelines he's really cool i have not like spoke to him or anything but i do like some of his uh episodes um and yeah he talks about like these uh so some of the things he does he's doing this 80s project i guess but he also does like some really fun like movies where they were like aping off of like nightmare on elm street and like halloween like these kind of knockoffs and i just think he uh yeah, he has a really interesting kind of thing to him. And he's also kind of a, a bit attractive, which I like as well. He is, um, he, is, he, is, he is really cute. Yeah, yeah. And he just like talks about some deep cuts. He's got some good deep cuts where some he of them are really bad does. movies, but like there are some like there's some fun ones in there for sure. So, yeah, if you don't want to just and we love, of course, Dead Me and like the big horror channels and all that. Don't get me wrong. But like, you know. Check out horror timelines too. There, there's some good shit going down. Yeah, for sure. Um, but I think that kind of brings us to an end to this uh, episode of ours about the initiation. Um, but Pickens, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show, talking about this little '80s gem and talking about it and just appreciating it for what it is and you know this is real 80s and not just like fucking fake ass 80s that we have nowadays <laughs> so like well, I mean, everything's gonna be fake ass 80s now because it doesn't exist anymore oh i know but they can't even like do it more realistically you know so i'm just like ugh. Like, okay. True. Like I thought Stranger Things season one did such a good job and then mm -hmm. the more the seasons progress it was like more neon, more synthy. Oh my gosh. It was like, okay, yeah. now it's like a little bit of a parody of itself. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you watched it or not. Did you watch that new Goosebump show on Hulu and Disney Plus at all? No, I'm uh there's just too many streaming services and too many things. Oh, I get it. Because and also, listen. I just I did if it's I just saw the live action movie that came out a few years ago and it was just it it was fun, but it was also like, oh. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that one partly takes place in the nineties and then partly takes place in present day. And, uh, I don't think I've said this on mic at all yet, but I did not like that show at all. Uh, really didn't care for it. I don't really know what they were going for. It was also produced by the same guy who did that movie. So like, Mm. you know i yeah, just was just, i don't know just the the first show had it right they just adapt the books just you know do that and just i don't know mm. they didn't yeah I, I i i don't think you need to to check it out like don't worry like it's just fine. keep reading the books they're fine keep reading the books keep trying to watch the show uh don't watch the new show i don't and it's getting a second season and okay fine what the hell do i know but that, oh i just want to rant about television for just one quick second <laughs> totally fine what i hate about new tv nowadays is that they're they're like eight to ten episodes long but it takes like two years to get a season two and then usually they cancel it after season two mm -hmm. and it just that's been driving me up a wall lately. Like if I find a show I really like, I'm like, oh, I love this. And then it ends like um, Severance. I loved it. And they ends on this cliffhanger. And then they finally announced like season two is coming 2025. I'm like, God fucking damn it. Mm. I, I know there is some behind the scenes drama. Like apparently the producers got into a fight. They don't like each other anymore. But apparently they finally are filming again. But now I'm like. Oh my god, it's just uh, it's exhausting. Mm -hmm. I'm tired. I'm tired. Yeah, imagine how tired we are, you know? Oh my god, but yeah. So, but I'm glad to have talked about this little movie. I think it's like a fun little 80s movie that's super cheesy and stupid, and it's kind of fun. And yeah, just go 
fucking watch it. Also, you need to watch um, Phantom of the Mall, Eric's Revenge. Go watch that. And I'm definitely going to check that out because, yeah, <laughs> seriously, I'm just a slut for mall movies. What can I say? Hell yeah. <laughs> All right. But uh, this brings us to our close. So, uh, Pickens, if you want to, please plug your social media if you want people to find you. Yeah. So um, you can find me. Um, I'm, I'm mainly I'm on Instagram at Party Pickens or, you know, you can I. I'm kind of on TikTok occasionally, you know, you can find me there. And yes, just, you know, come say hi. I'm pretty nice. You know, I had no idea who Jesse was. He followed me and then we started talking. So there you go. Shoot your shot. Exactly. He'll probably, you know, he'll probably message you back. Like, it's all good. Um, And, you know, depends on if you're cute or not, you know. Um, and as always, you can follow the show on Instagram at Cult Cinema Circle and on Twitter. I will not call it X at Cult Cinema Circle. You can also follow me on uh, Letterboxd at Jesse, J E S S E K R E M P, all one word, uh, to go see the movies I've logged and to go see what I think about movies or whatever the hell. Uh, also, please rate, comment, subscribe on your podcatcher of choice Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, uh, Spotify. Google Podcasts is actually going away. So don't worry about that one. Audible, Damn, all that kind of fun stuff. I know, right? Uh, and also on YouTube. So if you want to do that as well, um, yeah, give me like five stars one to two sentence review uh, gets people to know the show uh come talk to me come email me cult cinema circle at gmail.com whatever you know all that good stuff uh so we'll talk a little bit about what i'm doing next week so next week i'm also celebrating a little bit of an anniversary for this film and i'm gonna be covering a little movie from 1989 called teen witch have you seen oh, Teen Witch? Yes. Oh, I love that movie. Yeah, yeah. Teen Witch is super fun. So pretty much it's about a girl who's turned 16. She finds out she's a witch and hijinks ensue from there. Uh, it's a little bit of a musical, a little bit of like a coming of age movie. Uh, it is very decent. So please tune in next week where we will be covering that. That'll be super fun. Um, but as always, y'all, thank you so much for listening to the Cult Cinema Circle podcast. And remember, Delta Rogue. Delta- I never, never will, will die. die. Delta Row Row Kai never will, will die. die. <laughs> oh. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye.